Hi, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. We will get started in just a few minutes while we let other uh, attendees join. While you are waiting, we have a prompt question for you. Please put in the chat what your favorite way to engage students are. And then we will get started in a minute. All right, I think we can go ahead and get started. And thank you for those who are answering the question, putting your feedback in the chat, because it's so valuable to hear what folks are doing to engage their students, the recipients of the School Meals Program, uh, because we know students are critical stakeholders in success. All right, why don't we kick it off to the beginning slide? And also feel free to continue to add answers to the chat. Um, as your favorite way to engage students, um, because it's helpful for me and my team to see, like I said, what's being done around the country. All right, so welcome to the webinar, everyone. This is Morning Momentum, boosting student engagement in breakfast. I'm so excited you're joining us today. Next slide. I'm gonna cover a few housekeeping notes before we really dive in. This webinar is being recorded, and that means the slide deck and the recording will be sent out via email to all registrants after the webinar. And then, of course, this webinar, like all webinars that uh, the Center for Best Practices and No Kid Hungry does, will be on the Center for Best Practices website. Those are free, and you can access them at any time and share them with your networks. Uh, as a way to connect with other attendees, as we are seeing now, you have the chat box. Uh, you can share information there. And as we go through the webinar, um, I want this to be a little interactive if possible. So if you have other ideas that you want to share about how you've engaged your student body, what's been successful, please add it into the chat um, because the more information, the better. Uh, this is really about sharing best and promising practices. And then if you have any questions, please use the Q&A box on the Zoom menu. Uh, we will do our best to answer those questions in real time if we can. Otherwise, we have de designated Q&A time at the very end end of the webinar after our speakers share their information, and we will be able to get to those questions then. Next slide. All right, so this is how we're going to spend our time together. I'm going to introduce our fabulous speakers. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about Breakfast After the Bell, just to level the playing field about those programs or those breakfast models, I should say. And then I'm gonna hand it off to our speakers to share their expertise and information about student engagement. And then, like I said, we have a Q&A section at the end for more questions and discussions. Next slide. All right. So hello, uh, I'm Summer Kriegshauser. I am a senior program manager at Share Our Strength, and I'm so excited to be the moderator on our webinar today. We have two amazing speakers joining us are Rhea Rahman, senior manager uh, of youth engagement and empowerment at Share Our Strength, and Merendia Garner, supervisor of school nutrition in Greensville County Public Schools in Virginia. And they will share a little bit more about themselves and their experience when they, um, when they present. Next slide. All right, breakfast after the bell. This is just to level the playing field for all of those who are on the call today. So breakfast after the bell, when I, when I use that term, I'm talking about the alternative serving models where breakfast is served after the official start of the school day, and then students are allowed to eat outside of the cafeteria most likely in the classroom. So the three models that we promote the most are breakfast in the classroom, where breakfast is served and eaten in the classroom, 
grab and go to the classroom, which is exactly what it sounds like. Students grab breakfast on their way to class, usually from a kiosk um, or cart or even a quick cafeteria line head to their classroom and eat there. And then their second chance breakfast where the time of breakfast is just bumped to later in the morning. So this could be between first and second period. It could be um, from the beginning of school to uh, right in the middle of uh, lunch, knowing that some kids are just not hungry right at the beginning of the, of the day. And so having that second opportunity a little bit later when their hunger approaches, um, is a great way to catch those students and make sure they're getting the food that they need. Next slide. And the reason we love breakfast after the bell, many reasons, but we know that it hits equity. It sets an equitable playing field. It really does a great job of meeting the kids, meeting the students where they're at. We know that Breakfast after the bell ensures that more children have access to that morning nutritious meal because there are many variables that are beyond a student's control. How they arrive at school, when they arrive at school, if they had food at home, if they even had time to eat at home, and when their hunger is. So breakfast after the bell really does a great job of being an equitable approach to ensure kids get a morning meal. And then with all those different models and you can mix and match, it does a great job of meeting the unique needs of the school building and the culture. So it's really about determining what a school needs and those breakfast after the bell models can meet those needs. And then of course it brings school breakfast into the school day, just like school lunch. So it's essentially baked into the pie. It's a part of the school culture. It's a part of the daily schedule. So it's relied upon, it's expected. Um, and that can be a really great thing for kids to expect um, as they come into school. Next slide. And I think that's it for me. Rhea, welcome, welcome. So happy you're here to talk about your extensive experience in youth engagement and empowerment today. So I pass the mic to you. Thank you so much. I am so excited. I was saying it's been a long time since I've been on a webinar. So it's so great to see how many people have joined and I get to talk about some of my favorite topics. So I'm really jazzed. Thank you for having me. For those that haven't met me before, I work um, at on youth engagement and empowerment and it sounds exactly like it is. I work to make sure that students are a part of our child nutrition programs, that we are incorporating and engaging them in every way we can um, to help make these programs better. Um, I've been with the organization for about seven years and been working on student engagement the entire time. Um, I love kids. I used to be one. So like I said, this is my favorite topic. And I am going to talk to you specifically about gathering student feedback and this toolkit that we created specifically for that. So if we could hit the next slide, please. Okay. So it sounds like a lot of you are already doing some kind of student engagement in your schools or your programs. Um, I've seen a lot of taste tests and asking questions, feedback, all of that stuff. Um, so it sounds like there's already really great work happening. Um, but why should we gather student feedback? I think about these programs all the time as right, they're made for students, but rarely with them. And so by incorporating and gathering student feedback, we're really able to make sure that they are a part of the process and that these programs are really meeting them where they are. To confirm that, we actually completed a study um, amongst 12 to 18 year olds, and we found that 87% of teens are more likely to participate in school meals if they knew that their school gathered feedback on how to improve them. So that's a big percentage of people who want to participate, want to get give feedback, and then that in itself improves program participation. So it's kind of a win-win, in my opinion. Next slide, please. So there's a lot of ways to gather feedback. You have already shared them in the chat, so many of them. Um, the easiest way and the way that in our study, um, we had asked the students, what are the ways that they wanna give feedback? Overwhelmingly, the respondents said, we wanna do a survey. Surveys are really great for a number of reasons. They allow students to provide pointed feedback either on service models, specific menu items, 
um, without the pressure of any repercussions or thinking about, you know, oh, where is this information going? It could be anonymous. It could be on their own time. You have a lot of flexibility with surveys. They're also helpful for identifying which students want to engage in listening sessions down the road. So starting with a survey is a really great option. Um, and you can reach a really large audience. And I know that there are so many questions that you could ask in a survey. The wonderful thing is in our handy toolkit, we actually have two sample surveys. So we have one in English and one in Spanish, and it goes and covers a lot of different questions. And you can pick and choose to your favorites and then build your own survey. We also have tools in the toolkit, tools in the toolkit, um, where there are sample flyers for your surveys. There's also a QR code generator. So people could just scan the QR code and do the survey on their phone. We even have a how to use a QR code generator uh, tutorial on the toolkit as well. If you'll hit the next slide, please. So you've done a survey, you've gotten so much information about your nutrition programs and that feedback that students are giving. What do you do next, right? How do you get a little bit more in the weeds, understanding a little bit more what students are saying? Um, listening sessions, they're a great way to have students discuss their thoughts and beliefs and work with one another to help expand on ideas and even voice differences of opinion. And having a facilitator really lead that conversation to get more details and really understand where students are coming from. So if you'll hit the next slide, please. There's a lot of things that go into creating a listening session. And I think the first one is really bringing in your stakeholders. Um, so I've asked a couple of questions here of like who should be involved, what's in it for them, all of that stuff. So this might seem obvious, but the nutrition team, who is responsible for the success of the child nutrition programs? Um, they should be involved. They should be a part of this process. They should, they're going to benefit from the information that comes out of it. Um, program administrators, who are the people responsible for implementation of these programs? Um, it could be anywhere from actual like frontline cafeteria staff to teachers, administrators, people who are a part of the program in different ways um, and still are stakeholders. A facilitator, having someone who is actually going to facilitate the discussion, move the conversation along, um, really help gain as much insight as possible from the students. And then of course, your students, they're your program participants, they're your clients, they're your people. Um, they're the ones who are going to be sharing this information with you. And so they should of course be involved in the process. Um, next, please. Okay, so um, organizing the sessions. So an ideal session based on our experience is five to eight students and it will last about 45 minutes. Um, we definitely want to um, make sure that there's not a ton of students. We want to give everyone a chance to talk and engage with one another and having a smaller group of students is helpful in that. Um, having a 45 minute conversation is a really great amount of time because you're able to have a good number of questions without overwhelming them. And we don't want it to feel like a test, right? Where they're just getting question after question after question. We really wanna make room and time for as much conversation as possible. Um, one of the best practices that we recommend is to compensate your participants. A $25 gift card goes a really long way in making sure that the students are compensated for their time and for sharing their honest feedback and things like that. Um, creating a brave space for discussion and addressing power dynamics that can occur in these settings. Um, feedback is not as simple as just like asking a question and getting an answer back. It really is about the space that you're creating for the discussion, making sure that students feel comfortable to really share their honest thoughts and feelings, making sure that the power dynamics are balanced. So school power dynamics are just inherent in schools, right? Having an adult versus a student, there is something around that experience where, you know, it can create um, issues for uh, students to feel like they can say what they really want to say. And so being able to create a brief space, there's a 
tool in the toolkit that specifically talks about that, um, really talks about how you can build that brave space by like making acknowledgements, under, you know, recalling names, sitting in a circle, like little things like that, that we've learned over time that really help students feel more comfortable in these settings. And then of course, using a discussion framework to help move the conversation along in the toolkit resource, we do have a discussion framework. There's various questions that you can pick and choose from and, um, and cater it to your specific interests. Um, and so we tried to make it accessible for everyone. Um, so specific questions on like the menu or specific questions on the model of delivery or um, questions about stigma and things like that. There's definitely a lot in there for you to um, kind of pick and choose. Next slide, please. Okay, so I talked about this toolkit. I think I talked a little fast, sorry, Summer, um, but it's all online. So everything that I talked about, everything to get started, it's online. We have specific examples of how we've used this information. Um, we also have a really great quote from Mirandia, who you're gonna hear from next. And then we also have a feedback example. Um, and so, Basically, you can see our example working with Greensville Public Schools and then how we took the feedback and actually utilized resources from the Center of Best Practices to help address the feedback areas that the students gave. Um, so that's a lot of information. I'm happy to kind of hand it back over to Summer. Um, and then I will take a look at the questions in the chat too and maybe respond there. Yeah, thanks, Rhea. Uh, there were some questions that came up specifically for you, and we have some time, so I'm just going to read those now uh, since we're on this topic. Um, so there was a comment about the compensation, the $25. And as we know, school nutrition budgets are very tight. And so what if you just don't have that financial freedom to compensate in that way. Do you have other suggestions of um, how to essentially say thank you beyond saying thank you to students who participate? Yeah, I actually honestly think that um, obviously compensation is a great practice, but it also I understand that it's not always the easiest thing to do. And so being able to give students some like working with teachers to get them time out of the class, right, classroom to actually provide that feedback. So giving them at least a little bit of a benefit of like, hey, we're taking your time. You don't have to, you know, jump into class immediately or we're not taking your lunch hour or things like that. Um, I know no one gets a lunch hour. It's like a lunch 25 minutes, but like <laughs> making sure that you're pulling students aside so their time um, they're not giving you extra time, like before or after school, that could be a benefit. I think even going as far as like giving a thank you card, I think that's like, it just emotionally is helpful that you are actually being able to like appreciate their time and energy in the conversation. Um, I definitely think there's a additional benefits that you could give, um, like helping provide food, even if it is like new menu items that they could try um, during the conversation, that's also something that could be helpful. Um, and I do think asking people like No Get Hungry, <laughs> specifically Rhea, <laughs> I can't speak for the entire organization, but of course, like if the, these listening sessions are something you want to do, um, we can definitely talk about maybe providing a little bit of support there too, of how to give benefits to the students. But I do think overwhelmingly, the best part of these listening sessions is that every single one I've done, the students have said, thank you for listening to me. And thank you for making me feel heard. And I think that in itself, like, when they are appreciative of you, like returning that in the same feelings and verbally and saying that like, hey, we might not be able to make all of your suggestions happen, but like this information is going to help us. It is going to, you know, help move things forward in our programs. Just like sharing that gra sense of gratitude, I think goes a really long way and builds that person to person relationship um, that goes beyond just compensation. If that is helpful. Thanks for that, Rhea. Um, I'm gonna send another question to you. 
And the question is from Erica Jordan. She asks, how do you invite students to participate? She says, to keep the group small, like you suggested, um, do you accept up to the first eight who express interest or do you, is there a actual picking process? Like how do you, how do you do it? That's a great question. So it depends. Um, what we've done in our examples that we use to build the toolkit, we actually created an optional question at the end of our surveys to ask people, hey, are you interested in giving more feedback and being a part of the discussion? And so that actually helped us select students themselves. But sometimes you can actually work with teachers or principals or cafeteria staff that know the students and see them every single day. It might just be a prompt, right, um, one day at breakfast and just saying like, hey, we're actually interested in having some more feedback. Do you want to drop your email and we can kind of pick from a group? Um, or, you know, might have some teachers who are like, hey, they would give really great feedback. Um, I think Miranda might have picked a couple of students for us too, or um, that might have been a great one um, to have someone who knows the students. And it's like, I think we went into the school and they were like, they're going to tell you exactly what's up. Like they're, or having like a student, you know, ask their friends, right? There are a number of ways. And of course, five to eight is small, but you can do multiple groups. So you don't necessarily have to do like a hundred students, but you can definitely have like two or three different groups. So you have like a really well-rounded understanding. Um, and so, uh, and usually this happens all the time, but we might email 20 students that said they were interested and we'll get back eight, you know? So I do think it is sometimes a numbers game and like the more, the better. And if you're able to um, make as many groups as possible, but then um, also know that it's great to do a pulse check throughout the year. So you don't have to do all of your feedback groups in one go. You can say like, oh, you weren't selected for this round, but we might do, um, another one a couple of months down later in the semester, you know, at the beginning of the next semester, things like that. So really providing as much information as possible on timing is really helpful. Thanks, Rhea. And we're getting some good feedback as well in the chat. Folks are saying what they have done. Um, Melanie Gabrielle says that they use student council um, and uh, she also says we also have them come in for taste testing for possible products. Another person, Carla Horton, said the same thing. Tap into your district's existing leadership organization, student council, beta clubs, sport clubs. Um, so thank you for continuing to keep the chat lively because, like I said at the beginning of the webinar, any and all information about best and promising practices is welcome. So please continue to add your information for to the chat. Um, I will revisit the chat when we get to the Q&A because I just want to make sure these good ideas are being highlighted and they don't get buried um, in the rest of the great information coming our way. Summer, so, thing? yeah, please. Okay. Sorry, based on the chat, I do also want to say reach out to your statistics teachers because almost always there is an activity for students that they're supposed to create some kind of survey or poll. And so students like in a number of high schools that I visited, they're like, oh yeah, we get asked about our school meals all the time because the statistics class does it every semester. And so maybe even work with the statistics <laughs> for teachers um, to kind of be like, this is a great way for us to get feedback and like build a relationship with another teacher on campus and then hopefully students as well. So that was something that came up a bunch of times when we were asking students of like, hey, have you ever been asked for feedback before? And they were like, yeah, by my fellow peers all the time. So just wanted to put a plug in for that one too. That's so interesting. And Rhea, we are being asked in the chat for a link to that toolkit. Can you plug that in when you get a chance? Just about to. Absolutely. Thank you. And then, um, oh, Kelly McDonough from Share of Strengths said, if you don't have a budget for gift cards, consider soliciting donations from local businesses. That's a great idea, Kelly. Thank you for flagging coffee shops, movie theaters, the local uh, community, the local economy. Yes, tap into that. I think a lot of times they are more than willing to help. Okay, next slide. I think, Morendia, we are up to you now. Oh, and here's Rhea's information. Yes. Um, all right. 
Marindia, so happy to have you. Um, you're here from Greensville County Public Schools in Virginia. Marindia and I are going to do a casual panel discussion. And before I kick us off there, I put a little, uh, some fast facts about Marindia's district. Um, Marindia, do you want to say anything else about your district, about your student body before I dive into to questions with you? Um, you pretty much have it covered. Um, we do have three schools, an elementary school, a middle school, and a high school, district-wide CEP. We normally feed a probably about 1,200 breakfast meals a day, probably about 1,500 lunch meals a day. We operate uh, breakfast, lunch, fresh fruit and vegetable program, after school snack program, after school supper program. So we try to make sure everybody's covered, fed for the day. And I think we lost your video, Marindia. I do not see you anymore. Okay. There we go. Fantastic. All right. Let me pull up my questions. Give me one minute here. And actually, I'm going to um, take down the slide. Hannah, would you remove that slide so we can just have our images up? Fabulous. All right. So I'm so interested in the work that you do, Mirandia, and how you engage students. And first, I want to just ask, why do you think students are such an important stakeholder? There are so many elements about the school breakfast program that are make or break. Um, so many different stakeholders. Why do you consider students to be so important? I consider them to be so important because they're the they're the they're our customers. They're our primary reason for operating. Without the students, we wouldn't even have a reason to be here. You know. That's, I mean, they are the reason for the, for what we do. They are, so we need to cater things towards them, things they like, different things like that. It's all about them. Without mm -hmm. them, we're nothing. And so how do you approach engaging students? Like, for instance, do you map out an engagement strategy for the year? And like, you know, Rio was saying sort of plan listening sessions, or is it really like quarter by quarter, month by month, really taking the temperature um, on a more ad hoc basis? Honestly, it's, it's all of those of what you said, but I don't necessarily sit down and map it out. But what I do do is look at each school and see which programs that they have are suffering. Our major thing last year was the high school. So that's why I put my focus. I was like, why are kids not eating breakfast at the high school? What's going on? So I started, you know, zoning into that and what I can do to make that better. And then I just do that in all programs and all of our programs. So when you zoomed into the high school, what did you find out? that the major thing was the location of where breakfast was being served. The students didn't like the, the location. They didn't like everyone looking at them. So just knowing that little bit of information and changing the, the dynamics of where we served breakfast changed the whole program. And so what do you mean when you say students didn't like everyone looking at them? So I, you know how students are. It's a still way we already know it's a stigma associated with eating school meals. So, you know, they don't want their peers looking at them thinking that they need the food or different type of things like that. It's not that they didn't like it. They just don't want other people seeing them getting it. And where we had a station was in the view of everybody. You know, so if you had to walk by the like entire gymnasium to see who was getting what and different things like that. So by changing the pickup location of the food that completely changed the number of students that were getting that breakfast. Yes, ma'am. Well, changing the location of the of where we served it and actually finding out who our school champion was for school nutrition programs, it helped us tremendously. We took our breakfast cart from inside of the gym to the concession stand. We revamped the whole concession stand and made it into like a breakfast morning cafe, put a few pictures up from Team Nutrition, that's things they had, and... Had it set up like concession stand and the kids are, are rolling in. We got somebody who out there who's talking to the kids, engaging them, finding out, hey, why y'all not eating? Hey, I got this this morning. Y'all want to try this? I think that's important too, getting someone to promote your program within the department. Like, hey, what's going on? Why y'all not doing this? Why you not eating? Come over here and try this. Oh, we don't like that. You never even tried it. How you know you don't like it? So just communicating. Yeah. And so I'm also hearing enlisting more school stakeholders beyond the students, other folks that can help promote and engage, and then really 
understanding what high schoolers would want, you yes, know, ma'am. not just making it about, okay, we can set up a cart here. We can do this to make it easy for the cafeteria staff or, or, you know, whoever really you looked at what would make the high schoolers comfortable. Um, it made it more like what they would find outside of the outside. school. Like you said, like setting up a cafe, making it environmentally pleasing and comfortable and also just increasing their comfort level because, and I'm glad you addressed the stigma because the stigma is something that all school nutrition departments are up against all the time. And so truly to address that and take them into account, into your strategy, into your engagement is vital um, because that really, truly affects participation. Right. It does. And comfort level. Yeah. That's exciting that that works so well. Uh, and I was going to, I was going to ask like, what were some of the most, or what are some of the most successful examples of student engagement, but you gave one with the high school, right. but that I was, would love to hear more that um, was just about how you was... tweaked. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. That was our most successful one. I mean, we actually did a listening session with no kid hungry. I was, cause I was like, I need some help. Y'all help me. So they actually are real. And another member also, they came in and we actually held listen sessions found out what the students, what the reasons were. And we found out through the listening session who our school champion was outside of the school nutrition program. And when I tell you, he made a huge impact on the school. He did. He just started standing outside the, when the students got out the bus in the morning. They were like, hey, y'all, y'all know we got um bananas, sausage, biscuits, orange juice for breakfast today. You know, it's the most important meal of the day. I'm getting a breakfast. Make sure you get a breakfast. And I mean, it really, it really picked up. It, I mean, numbers were from like 20 serving 20 meals a day to we reached over 200 breakfast meals a day just by changing location and having that champion out there. So it makes a difference when you talk and communicate with your, with your students. It, it really does. We do. And the importance of champions as well. This is big. So can you say this stakeholder, who is the champion? Was it a principal, another teacher, a school bus it, driver? It was the, it was a band. It was a, um, one of the band directors. Oh, very nice. Yep, one of the band directors. And the students say they respect him. Pretty much if he, whatever he said, we know he's real. We believe him. We know he has our best interests at heart. So we trust him. Yeah. I can jump in um, because I was in the listening session when they mentioned the band director. Literally, there were students who weren't even in band and they're like, oh no, I trust him. Like if he tells me to do something, I'm going to do it. And so it was just like a resounding yes from all of the students. And it just took one student mentioning this person and then they all just like were enthusiastic about them. And so that was like one of the best ways we're like, wait, you have to talk to this person. Like they're so trusted in the school. And so that was a really fun, like surprise that we didn't even realize was going to come up in the conversation. I love that shout out to the trusted messengers because they exist in every single school and you just have to find them. And the kids really do. They respect them, that messenger. They trust what they say. They believe it, you know? And this is the value of um, that positive adult influence when it's just a nudge, you know? It's just a nudge. Have you eaten today? This is what we have. They're, you know, they're not forcing kids to do anything. It's just that gentle nudge from a trusted messenger that is so valuable um, that without it, that really does affect participation. Um, okay. Oh, I know you have this great program, Miranda, called the Greensville County Public Schools Produce Market. Oh, Would yes. you share what that is and how that engages the students, but probably the whole community? Am I right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. ma'am. So this year we partner with Lulu's Local Foods and we are offering a produce market to all families of students in the county. And what happens is the third Monday of the month, we get a huge produce truck in. We set it up like a farmer's market or either a drive-through food bank and families come, they get food, um, it, all fresh produce right off the right in off the back of the truck. Look, I like came right from the farm. So that building that that engagement with the community and also tell them, hey, you know, what we do with the school nutrition department, we also we're gonna feed them while we're here and we're also trying to help you at home. That, you know, that gets parents thinking, oh, okay, I didn't know you did this. Oh, this is awesome. Different, different kind of things. I mean, it's, we got to feed them. We got to feed our babies. So any kind of way that I can find out to partner outside of school to help them get meals, I'm going to do that. 
So this brings up a really interesting point because we're focusing right now on student engagement, but there is incredible value on caregiver and parent engagement. And if parents know that you care about their kids, you're working to feed them healthy food, you're presenting this other program where there's fresh produce available, it can really change hearts and minds because the stigma about school meals, it also, there's there can be a negativity about like maybe the parents grew up with a different school meals where their school meals weren't great and they remember it and they think that that's the kind of school meals their kids are getting and they maybe don't know the great food that's being served and like the love and care that's putting into that. And so Miranda, have you found an increasement in or an increased amount of engagement through this program and engaging the community and then like it trickles back to the school meals program and student engagement as well. I, I do. I do think, well, honestly, I'm going to say any event that's going on in the community, I'm trying, I'm there. I'm pushing information about what we have, school meals, hey, they're free. You know, even if you bring your lunchbox, your children still eat for free. But I think once you get to the get to know the community, like you said, and they really know what you're doing, hey, we're what we're serving, it's not it's not school lunch that you, you that you were used to when you went to school. It's a whole new ball game. So they're like, oh, okay. Oh, y'all got chicken wings. Oh, I didn't know that. They never come home and tell me y'all have chicken wings. I'm like, oh, yes, we do. We have this. We just we have this. So just educating them on what we have, telling them where they can find our menus, doing things in the community to build that relationship. I think that I think that's critical. I do. And I think it is important to every opportunity that you can engage, engage the community you do. And this means it's more time for you. It's more time for your staff. You know, it. I recognize that. Um, and so it's not always possible. Uh, but if it is, it could have big dividends. Yeah. And this also brings me back to local support. You know, asking like, how do you compensate students who participate in listening sessions if you don't necessarily have a budget and reaching out to the local community and i would think if you're regularly engaged in the local community they know what you're doing they know the good that you're bringing to students they are more likely to want to help and to want to be involved and to want to donate goods have you found that to be the case well we actually have students that help us with this program as well we do um the cooperative extension. They up every market we have. They bring no less than three or four kids to come out there and help us. So when kids see other kids, they're like, hey, I want to do that, and what I solicit volunteers from everywhere. So again, that is it's a lot. I'm muted. Sorry about that. I was just saying, absolutely, yes, absolutely. Um, it sounds like you're doing such a fabulous job with engagement. But what have you found to be just common struggles that are there in the world of student engagement and that just come up and how have you addressed those? So the most common struggle that I deal with is students don't want to give feedback. They're like, oh, what I say, it's not going to matter. You're not going to listen to me. But then they'll turn around and give the their friend in line, oh, you know, they'll tell them, oh, why, why they got to have this? Why can't they have this? I think that they think, It'll fall on deaf ears like what they say doesn't matter. And what I tell them is it does matter. It could be something as simple as, hey, these napkins are so hard. Can we get some softer napkins? Let me know that. Let me know so I can know what will make you all happy, what will make you all participate in the program. It's, it's all about them. I tell them it's all about you all. We're not, we're here for you. Y'all are not here for us. Yeah, and this goes back to what Rhea said of when she does the listening sessions having kids say, I didn't even know people were going to listen to me. Like, I didn't even know I had a place to go to share this information. So being receptive, being open, and then not only that, then having change based on that feedback is so powerful um, for students, I think, of any age, you know? Right. Um, so that's really, that's fantastic. Um, do you notice different struggles in different age groups? You know, elementary school has their own struggle struggles. The middle and high school has different struggles with engagement. Um, I do. The high school is is the most difficult. Um, you know, younger kids they'll tell you what 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 they'll tell you. They'll be real. Oh, I don't like that. You know, I don't like that. But the high school is kind of like quiet about it. They don't want to tell you, but they'll tell their friends. Um, most of the time at the at the elementary level, I kind of listen to what staff say or you know what students tell teachers because they you know they help us a lot and sometimes as far as engagement 
honestly just standing by a trash can and be like, hey, why are you throwing that away? You know, what's wrong with that? You don't like that? Or just standing by when they come in and they look at the menu on the screen or they come through the line and be like, mm, no, nah, you know, just standing there. Hey, what's go tell me, you know, talk to me. What's going on? Sometimes you just got to get out there and you got to meet them where they are. Go out there to the table, sit down with them, you know, eat lunch, walk around. You just got to meet them where they are. And it also sounds like you really do know your students. Like you're familiar enough with them. You know their names. Um, and they it seems like they feel comfortable to continue talking. If you come around, you know, they don't quiet up. They don't like switch topics. Or am I wrong about that? No, you're right. And the managers at each school are awesome. So they have great relationships with the students. They call them by name. And they tell me, um, hey, the kids are not eating this. Or the kids love this. I even got a video from one from the school champion. He sent me a video of students telling me, hey, we love this. Keep this on the menu. So it's just like knowing who you are and having that relationship, whether it's the relationship with the school champion, with the managers, with the servers, or with me, or with anybody else on the school nutrition team. It's about having that relationship and listening to what they're actually saying. Yeah, and it sounds like constantly nurturing that relationship as well. Yes, right. yes because then you're building trust. Communication is uh, flowing a little bit easier. So it is. it sounds pretty constant, but it sounds absolutely valuable and totally doable at the same time. Let's see. Um, we talked about, my next question was about um, student engagement, depending on the ages of the students. So I want to go back. It is interesting how in elementary school, the kids tell the teachers more mm -hmm. than anything. Mm -hmm. So having that teacher communication, this is where the big framework of stakeholder communication within the school and the district is so important because you have the high schoolers, you go directly to them mm -hmm. to get the feedback. There are various ways to do it. And then in elementary, you rely on the teachers because they, sh they, they share it with the teachers, mm -hmm. you know, like you, right. you have to know which stakeholder to approach to get the feedback that you need. Right. And like, as far as breakfast, um, you, there, a lot of the people, so we have breakfast carts on our elementary level. So a lot of those people who work the carts there, they pay attention to what the students get, what they don't like. And they'll come back and tell members, Hey, this, they didn't get this today. You know, they, they're not really liking that. Maybe we should say, you know, tell someone, hey, let's take that off the menu or let's add something different. You know, it's, it's something as simple as a juice flavor makes a whole difference. You know, like, oh, I'm not going to, oh, I don't, I don't like that kind. So, I, you know, it just got to cater it towards them. What do they like? That's what we're here for. So this makes me wonder because some places across the country are still having procurement struggles, like, like with the food and ordering and availability of products. So what happens when you, you don't have access to a product that is a favorite of students or your menu is switched up because the manufacturer couldn't get the products to you on a particular week? Like how do you navigate that while still trying to be pleasing to the students? Right. Um, supply chain issues are still real. Yeah. So you have to make do with what you got and make your winners your winners. Like when you do get something that they like, you really got to put it on there. You really got to promote it. But sometimes you have to explain to them, it's, hey, we tried. It's not my fault. Um, you, I, Be honest. You know, don't, you know, be honest, but we don't have this because of such and such. But when we can produce those wins, those things that their favorites, we put them out there. We go beyond to make sure it's the best. We just got to, it's, it's, it's hard when you don't get in, but you have to make it work. Yeah. Name of the game, make it work, make it work, make it work. Make it and work. I appreciate you saying, just being honest with the students, communicating yeah. what's really happening because they don't know about procurement stuff. They don't yeah. know about, you know, the hardships on the manufacturing, the distributor chain, like they don't know. Right. So keeping that in, them informed and helping them understand that, yeah, it's not, you don't have control, but you're doing the best you can because you care about making sure the students eat and enjoying what they eat. All right. Um, I think I might go to the chat because I think there might be some questions there and I may ask Rhea to come back um, because we're going to open it up to us three. Welcome back, Rhea. Let's see. Um, I'm going to go to the chat right now and look for um, questions. But while I do that, I'm going to ask you both a question and you can ping pong 
your answer. Um, so I like this one. And Mirandia, you, you kind of uh, touched upon this a little bit in, in sort of various ways, but connecting with the students is so valuable. Um, and how do you build empathy between the school nutrition team that you work with? And like you said, your managers are awesome. You have these other, you know, staffers that are part of your team that are great. How do you build empathy between the school nutrition team and the students to help really truly understand what the students are going through? You know, because high school students are going through so much. Elementary students are going through different things. And um, the school meal can be a really nice grounding thing, you know, a school breakfast, a grounding thing in the morning, it's expected. Um, and this can be a part of um, just a healthy school experience. So how do you build empathy in, on your team? And Rhea, feel free to chime in at any point. Yes, I, I mean, I think knowing knowing the struggles of 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 life in general and trying to connect meet students where they are meet the staff where they are and find a common ground hey you know things might be hard but i'm here for you got this got this breakfast for you come on in and talk to me you know just communication i'm i'm just going to put it all back on communication communication goes goes a long way whether it's a good morning how are you or Hey, I see you upset today. What's wrong? You know, whether it's staff, students, or what. I mean, communication. I'm going to say communication. It has to be strong communication. Rhea, do you want to add anything to that in your experience? Yeah, I was going to say, I had a student tell me that they can feel when people care about them. And it can be the smile as you're handing someone their food item or when you're like, you know, seeing them type their numbers in the POS system. Am I, is that? Yes, right. right. Okay. I was like, I don't know. I just know that students have to sometimes type their numbers in, but I, whenever someone cares about you, you can feel that. And it's just is as simple as like, oh, I know what you usually like for breakfast. Let me get that for you. Or like that customer service aspect of it, I think is really important. And it literally is like one student says like, I get breakfast every day because she smiles and she knows my order and like gives it to me. And that makes me feel good when I'm starting my day, right? Like it can be something so simple, but it does like it builds that community. It builds that empathy. It builds that connection. And I do think that we talked about trusted messengers, right? Like when you're seeing someone every single day and you know that their job is to feed you and care about you, then you're building a relationship with them. You're learning to trust them. And so I think that's really important. And so smile more <laughs> is maybe my uh, recommendation. And I think even just knowing students' names, I know that's such a small thing, but I think it's so powerful because that shows that I see you. I see you. I know you. I know your name. I, like Rhea said, you know, you're coming in every day. You're eating the food. Uh, all right. So we do have several questions that have come in. So uh, the first one is, do you have any suggestions to get administration on board with breakfast in the classrooms? We have, we get this question a lot in various ways, administrative buy-in. Um, I think really, I would love to hear from like this, how do you frame it from the student perspective of how this is going to help students and then therefore help the rest of the classroom and, and therefore um, the school. What do you think, Mirandia? Um, I'm fortunate enough to have our superintendent. He has been an overseer of a school nutrition department before. So he knows the struggles. He he knows firsthand what it is. So he knows barriers that we face with administrators and different type things. So he's a great advocate for our program. So if you can get your leaders on board, I don't know. I mean, I I have a great one, so I don't have that issue. But if you can get your leader on board, I think that's awesome. Just let them walk a day in your shoes, see what you do, how important it is, and the rewards and the benefits from it. This makes me think of, we actually did a webinar a few weeks back on uh, principal, teacher, other administrative buy-in, 
And we have other ex, uh, school nutrition experts talking about this. So I'm going to put that webinar in the chat mm -hmm. so y'all can see it. Um, and then you can see all the great answers uh, from that webinar as well and from those experts. But this is the struggle we hear a lot. And so um, you're not alone, Chastity, in this. And next question, how do you find a spot that students feel is private without the stigma, but also an accessible, convenient location for everyone in the building? So Miranda, you talked about a this a little bit with your high school experience. So how do you find that balance of what works for everyone? Well, to be honest, we know we're not going to please everyone every time, but just kind of standing back and ask them, hey, you know, do you think, do you think more you would like it here? Do you think you would like it here? Just asking in feedback. And as far as us using the concession stand, that was a, we went on a walkthrough with the team. I, I mean, like the finance department and everything was there. And they was like, hey, this space is open. What do y'all think about this? And I was like, hey, they are the kids are used to going to concession stand. It's right here. It's not in front of everybody. It's off to the side. So when they walk in, they could grab it and go. It was like, hey, you just got to solicit help from everybody. Get somebody who's not, directly related with your program get them to come on a walk through with you because people see things that we don't see because we deal with them day to day we're here day to day and we will overlook it but if somebody from maintenance or instructional team finance department they walk in but like, hey what about this and you'd be like i never even thought about that so just soliciting help from others getting feedback that's such ria do you want to add anything I was just going to say feedback from the students, put it in the poll, like the survey of where do you think we should put our breakfast cart or things like that. Um, I knew a high school where, I mean, they had the means for this, but they had breakfast in four different places. So like in certain hallways, so like anyone could walk through depending on which entrance they were at the coming into the school, but it, it wasn't highly visible and so they gave multiple options luckily um but it wasn't like where everyone sees you so I think like thinking about that specifically of like what is close to the congregation point but not exactly like right in the thick of it and then again like asking students because they will have ideas like they will they will probably have been thinking about them <laughs> over a while and so putting that in a survey or asking that question in a listening session is is going to go a long way. Uh, another question that came in the chat, um, Pam asks, does the market take place on school property, Morendia, or at a partner's location? Mm. It's a, we do it on our on school property. It's after school hours. We know we run it from 4 30 to 6. The buses have already gone. We do have to like pause a little bit for the after school program buses to leave, but we do it. The produce one right on the bus loop. Cars come in, line up just like they're on the bus. We give them their stuff and they go. And there's another question relating related to this produce market. Kristen asks, is there a grant or other source that is used to procure that fresh produce or is it donated from a local company? It was a well a company actually got the grant. And they buy and they pay for the stuff. I order the items, but they pay for the items. So they it is a grant, it's grant funded. Uh that's a great point that there are grants out there. Mm -hmm. Uh and that's part of I mean, it's part of uh the the school nutrition work of finding those grants, whether they're national or statewide or just even local, and getting more support available if if that's possible. I'm going back to the chat from the very beginning because y'all said so many great things about how to engage students. Um, Open-ended questions, that's a really good one because then you give the opportunity for students to share their voice in how, whatever that means for them. A lot of taste testing uh, came up, which is great. We definitely recognize that as a best practice. Um, surveying students to see what they would like on the menu. Mm -hmm. Speaking it to them in the line, another person said, Tammy Cooper said yes. Um, encouraging them to try new foods, feedback from students. Um, someone said, Mark Wilson said, let them create lunch breakfast items. Uh, join them for a meal and ask them. Merendia, you talked about that. Just going up to the table, asking them, you know, in real time, seeing what's going on. And let's see, more taste testing, surveys, excellent. Um, 
Esther did ask what POS method you're using for the second chance breakfast. Merendia, do you want to add anything about POS systems? Well, we don't use our POS systems for breakfast. We do check off sheets. And um, right now our second chance breakfast is not, we're not serving over, we're not serving in abundance. So we don't really need to use the POS for that right now. Got it. Uh, Chastity did answer in the chat saying barcode scanner into power school, which is an online program. So thank you for that. Chastity, so much great stuff in the chat here. Um, and I did put in the link to the webinar a couple weeks ago that does address stakeholder engagement for different stakeholders. So teachers, principals, administrators, a really how to get that stakeholder buy-in for breakfast after the bell, because we do know it can be a struggle, especially for a stakeholder who knows nothing about breakfast after the bell, who knows nothing about breakfast in the classroom and just sees that as chaos when really it can be a great program um, that can benefit all stakeholders. We have a couple more minutes for questions. Let me see. Oh, um, I'm curious about um, how social media can be used to engage students. Rhea or Merendia, any comments on that? I can jump in really quickly. Um, so a lot of students get their information from the school Instagram page, if there is one. Instagram's a really big one among like the 12 to 18 audience. And so they were saying like, oh, that's where we get information. But the school website in itself is a really handy tool based on a lot of students. Um, and then if there are screens in the school. I know that's something that's used that's not necessarily social media, but like QR codes on the screen to get that information out to students is helpful. Um, I have had the experience where I went to a school and they said that there is a student who on TikTok every day gets the first school lunch and will live eat it on TikTok and then give like immediate reactions. <laughs> And that's what the students look at before they go into the line to get food and like what they're going to get based on that student's TikTok example. Um, so like, don't be afraid of it, but it is like, there are, there's a lot of different ways. And I think that could be like, you could spin on that, right? Like have a teacher try the meal and put it on TikTok and like put that on the Instagram or, you know, like if there's new menu items, like there's a lot of different ways, but Instagram, using the school Instagram page, if there is one um, for information, and then um, sharing the QR codes when you're in the school, and then um, try TikTok. It's scary, but it's where they're at, you know? So it's, what do you do? It's where the kids are at. It's true. Mirendia, do you want to add anything to that? Um, for us, we have a communications team that posts things on our web on the website for us. So what I do is I send a lot of things. I just keep sending information, keep sending information so people can see us. I send trays, line setups. We even um had a little partnership with our photography club. They took some pictures of students eating. You know, oh, yeah, nice, yeah. good pictures of students eating. So I'm like, I sent them to the communications team and they posted. So if people see it, like, oh, that's what y'all serving. The pizza looked like like that, you know. That'll catch their attention. They'll be like, next time they had it, I'm going to be in there. I'm getting that, you know. Visuals are so important. Yep. So important. Uh, Hannah, can you throw up the slides again? We just have a few more closing housekeeping notes, and then we will wrap up because I know we're about at time. Next slide, Hannah. All right. Stay in touch, please, please. If you subscribe to our newsletter, uh, you will get notifications about all these great webinars coming your way. Uh, and then our website, bestpractices.nokidhungry.org has all of these webinars on tap. You can access them for free at any time, share them out with your networks. Next slide, Hannah. All right. So we are going to be doing a short survey. It's going to pop up once I close the webinar. And it's just about what you thought about the webinar and what other topics you'd like us to cover. And we really do read all the feedback. We listen to you because it's important for us to provide information to help you soar and achieve all your dreams and goals in the school nutrition world. So please fill out that survey and let us know what else you would like to see. Oh my goodness. I'm sorry, my cat. Um, next slide. Uh, and that is it. Thank you so much for attending, everyone. Merendia and Rhea, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and all your hard work. And everyone who put information into the chat, thank you as well. Uh, have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.